Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. This is Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast, episode number 291. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. This is your host, Bruce Hutchin, and I'm really happy to have part two of Sean Greathouse. Sean's been so successful taking the Colorado Big 8. He's taken some monster whitetails, and he's also been to Asia and took a Asiatic uh, water buffalo. So stay tuned. He's going to wrap up the show telling you secrets and lessons learned. Hey, listeners, don't forget to text 33444 Food Plot for your free Food Plot ebook. So, Sean, uh, welcome to part two of your show. Thank you, Bruce. I appreciate it. So, let's get right into the Colorado Big 8 species uh, with bow and arrow and just highlight. Um, you know, the animals you've taken with shorts and um, short stories. And then let's talk about, I believe, your most recent um, uh, harvest was a mountain goat someplace in the San Juans. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, so so the Colorado Big 8, uh, there's there's 10 different big game animals that I think we talked about a little bit earlier in Colorado. And there's uh, Rocky Mountain sheep, Rocky Mountain desert, or I mean, not uh, desert bighorn sheep, Rocky Mountain sheep, um, mountain goats. There's uh, white tailed deer, mule deer, elk, antelope, black bear, um, mountain lion, uh, and there's probably a couple of moose, Cyrus moose, um, that make up the ten. And essentially, um, once you complete eight of the ten w- with a bow, there's a there's kind of a little awards at the banquet, and it's it's just kind of a an achievement, which some guys don't really set out to do, but you know they'll get five or six, and then they hey I'm pretty close, and then they start you know putting in for licenses for the others, and and end up um, hopefully someday you know with that achievement. And uh, the two that I don't have is the Shiras moose and the desert bighorn. And the desert bighorn, there's only, I think, nine tags or something like that in the whole state. And there's no preference point system for them. So every year, you've got as good odds as the next guy, except for there's 6,000 of you putting in for those nine licenses. So odds of drawing that tag are slim to none. The Shiras moose... Um, I've been putting in for that since before they started the weighted point preference point system in Colorado. And I just, uh, for whatever reason, I can't seem to draw a Cyrus moose tag. But uh, I have been fortunate enough to hunt and take the other eight species. And um, you know, I just got back from a uh, mountain goat hunt in early October um, down in the San Juan Range, um, kind of between Durango and Silverton. And uh, that was that was a, a fun hunt. Um, and we got to ride the narrow gauge railroad in um, where we jumped off the train. Essentially, they, they stop at a trailhead, and, and we were able to hike up towards some of the 14ers and, and hunt mountain goats and spent 10 days on that hunt and was able to um, connect with a, a nice billy with with a nice coat, and so that was that was my goal. I wanted a mature billy with a with a nice winter coat because uh, the the mountain goat I'd killed 18 years previously was a nanny uh, with a short summer coat. <laughs> so, uh, um, but that that was a lot of fun. So that's kind of what the the um, big eight is and what it's all about. Um, but what's what's really kind of cool about the big eight is not so much the the animals themselves, but the different environments and the different um, tactics and ways of hunting these animals. Um, you know, you're going to hunt antelope maybe differently than you would a, a Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep um, and some of those things. So that, that's that been the, it's, it's more the journey 
of the hunt as opposed to the actually killing the animal. Um, it's seeing all the different environments and, and that's what makes it fun for me. Now, um, let's tell the people, you know, out east and other parts of the country where they don't, you know, they don't have the number of, of different species. So just walking through and, and say, okay, 10 years ago I took an elk and, you know, it took me five days or whatever. And just give a short, you know, synopsis of each of the hunts. Right. So, boy, it's hard to, she put me on the spot here. It's hard to remember all of them just offhand like that. I guess that's, um, but, but basically it, it really varies. Um, drawn, you know, like a, you know, a mule deer hunt is something that, um, I didn't start out going for the big eight. It just kind of played out. And when I realized I was close, I might not normally have hunted a, a mountain lion. Let's just say, you know, that, that this wasn't always on my things I wanted to do. But when I found out I was close and I uh, had an opportunity to kind of fall my way, I was able to go on a mountain, or a mountain lion hunt. And um, the mountain lion hunt, surprisingly, was one of the harder hunts that I had been on. Um, but, you know, um, the deer, you know, that those can take a day, they could take a week, they could take a season, you know. Um, it just kind of worked out as I was growing up and learning about bow hunting. And every time I go out, I'd learn something new. And, you know, I, that's the first year I hunted. I, I killed a nice bull elk with my bow. Even though I hunted antelope and deer and everything else, I didn't. The only thing I harvested was a was an elk. The next year, the only thing I harvested was an antelope. So um, it just kind of progressed, and little by little, um, I found myself getting closer to that that achievement. And had a friend who had some hounds um, that. Um, asked me if I was interested in going on a lion hunt and it took 12 outings before I killed my first uh, mountain lion and uh, we'd seen some smaller cats and we'd been on some chases that didn't amount to much and one thing or another but I thought that was going to be a slam dunk easy hunt and that was one of the hardest hunts I've been on physically and, and mentally both. Now what about so, the black bear because we only can hunt them in the fall so how did that right. come out? So so that's that's kind of a, a good story. That was my last animal to complete my big eight. And um, I used to work at a company called Dart International, which is a company that um, makes simulated archery target systems for archery shops, basically video screens that you shoot at, um, and it highlights where your arrow hit and your score and all that stuff. I used to install those back in my early 20s, and I worked for a gentleman uh, named Fred Eichler. And a lot of folks know who Fred Eichler is in the uh, hunting industry now. He he has a um, guide service. Of course, he's got his own television show. Um, he's got a couple shows. And uh, so I called my buddy Fred up and said, Fred, uh, you know, I need a black bear to complete my Colorado Big Eight. Um, and he lives down in southern Colorado, where there are tons of black bears. And uh, so I was fortunate enough to go down there. I spent a day. He drove me around and basically pretty much gave me free free run of uh, a certain area and said, yep, you can hunt any of this down here. And so um, I was able to go down there. And where I ended up killing my black bear, uh, I sat in a blind for days. And, of course, uh, sitting on a watering hole on in a blind in a little wooden box, basically, I'd see elk come in, I'd see deer come in, no bears were coming in. And I got to the point where I couldn't take it anymore, sitting in that blind. Um, So Fred had actually killed an elk, uh, oh, three or four days prior. Um, And I said, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to sit on that that elk's gut pile. And that's where I ended up killing my black bear. It was off of of, uh, an elk that he'd shot a few days earlier. I had five or six bears come in that morning. Um, some were styles with cubs, which you can't shoot, um, but I ended up uh, connecting, and that's what completed my big eight for me. So, so how many years did it take you to do your big eight? Um, start to finish, let's see, I, my first was in 93, and I think 2007 is when I killed my black bear. So it took 
was that 14 years, 14 seasons. Wow. And again, it, it wasn't, it wasn't with the goal when I started, I didn't even know, you know, that there was a big eight thing. Um, so when it started, it, it wasn't like I was starting out to do that. It just kind of, um, happened. And, uh, I have a, my, my business partner, um, for the archery uh, company, all he needs is a whitetail now, and he'll have his big eight. And uh, it's kind of crazy to think that you know a whitetail of all the other tags, all you need is a whitetail, and you'll have your your big eight. Actually, he'll have his big nine because he killed a uh, Shiras moose. Um, but they don't count the big eight until you get your whitetail. So, <laughs> so he'll have his big eight and his big nine out of the ten. Oh my goodness! Now, is that all through Colorado Bowhunters Association? Yeah, yes, it is. That this particular one is through the Colorado Bowhunters Association. You know, there's different uh, the Super Slam club they have different uh things obviously like the super slam the north american 29 big game animals or whatever um they have the things called like the super 10 which is the poor man's slam they have different things like that but this particular achievement is just kind of through the colorado bow hunters association i think arizona has something similar um there's a few states that have and recognize you know bow hunting achievements like that that that's really interesting and folks the reason i'm spending some time on that in, in part two is because we all have goals and and i know um at my age now you know i've been fortunate to hunt a lot of places in north america and and you know i've collected a few a few representative heads here and there and and but mostly for me it's it's the journey because i've been in some hellacious situations <laughs> And I can laugh now, but I wasn't laughing then. I've been nine feet from a charging grizzly bear and walked away unscathed. So, um, yeah, that was that was Pucker Parker time. Yes, I did go back to the camp, and I, yes, I did take a full shower, and yes, I did wash my clothes. <laughs> that's good. Uh, oh, that's funny. Yeah, true story. A kid named Jimmy Bruno up in out of Cody, Wyoming. He was my guide. We were up on the Thoroughfare River, and. And, uh, man, we were in this really nice, really nice canyon. It was a box canyon. And and so he says, we're going to sit here. It's just pitch black. It was 4 o'clock in the morning. And he, and he says, I'm going to start just bugling, and then we should p- pinpoint a couple of herds of elk in here. And I said, okay, fine, blah, blah, blah. So we sit there, and he'll call, and then he'll just say, Shh, we won't do anything. It just calls. And then 15, 20 minutes later, calls again, and then the sun start come up, and then all of a sudden, they, you hear the elk bugles bouncing off the walls. He said, so he figures it out, and said, okay, we can get on this, this bull down here. So we drop in, drop in, and all he does is cow call now, because he's dropping in on him. And, uh, you get closer and closer, and he says, not too far, and he says, you know, get ready, and all this, it's all primed, and then up to our right, above us, all of a sudden, here's the crash, he goes, he just looks at me and goes, you know, get ready, you know, sign language, to get ready to go, so I uh-huh. drop to my knees, and uh, about 50 yards away, <laughs> out walks this grizzly bear, he goes, his just Ooh. eyes lights up, and he's got his... <laughs> He's got his forty four Magnum on it and uh he just he just motions me to said and with his mouth, don't move. He didn't speak, he just said don't move. So, uh-huh. so and he's staying right behind me and as we go he's pivoting me, you know, so I'm between him and the bear and the bear is just kinda of looping and the bear hits the trail that we came in on. There was an elk trail and he hits that and he senses us. So he pops up, he's full you know, he's full standing up, he's probably four four hundred pound bear. Might be less, might be more. We'll call him for uh-huh. So he starts yeah. pop, it's popping his jaws. Oh. And then he and then he goes and so Jimmy right then he popped his jaws, Jimmy just goes bam in the air. So that's shot number one. Two, as soon as he shoots, he just drops down and I'll shut my eyes right now and I can see just the ripples <laughs> of the muscles in the in the and he's coming down the trail and the claws digging in and the dirt just not flying back. It's all in slow motion, folks. And then he shoots beside him and then bear keeps coming. And then the last shot, I'm right behind Jimmy Bruno in a, a live pole pine and he's got his hand out. So that's, that's, uh, that's three feet. Boom. Right over his head. He did not shoot him because he can't because we're in a bear one area. And, and, uh, 
just right over his head, and we could later, and I wish I'd film crew this would have been classic but anyway so he digs in all four paws skids and goes off the other way <laughs> yeah that's that's too close for comfort yeah and it's just you know I, yeah. I share that folk because that's the journey that's why I hunt is, is for stories like that and be able to share it with you guys and and I went back to Cody and got um, and got Jimmy Bruno with a, a bronze uh, of a grizzly bear and I, I put to shoot him high from stand behind <laughs> But I'll never forget that. I mean, that was a long time ago. I was 40 years old. That was 30 years ago that happened. Uh And but Uh you think about that, and you know the stories that you've talked about going in Australia, and and that's the hunting tradition. So I'm going to segue right in there. Talk to me about the hunting tradition in your family and how you're sharing it with um, your wife and um, and others. So uh, yes, that's archery is a a way of life in our household. And um, you know, we basically, everything revolves around archery to some degree, whether it's um, going out and we enjoy the 3D and um, archery tournament competitions. That's something that I was able to, um, it was a passion of mine. And so when I had kids, um, they've grown up since the ages of five and six with bows in their hand, um, tagging along with me at, to these archery tournaments. And it's been a good way just to spend quality time together. And so, of course, as we grow and, and uh, you know, shoots have gone by and all that, we, we that's just a natural transition for hunting because a lot of the folks at these 3D shoots are hunters themselves and are talking hunting stories and, and uh, what tags they have coming up and what tags they ended up having to eat and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so... You know, my wife, when she married me, and I was a hunter, and her her dad was a a hunter as well, so she it wasn't foreign to her. But we started hunting together, and um, she's been fortunate enough to, fortunate enough to harvest uh, you know a, a deer with a rifle when we first met when we were engaged, and then she's been bow hunting ever since. And uh, something that's pretty cool is she's been fortunate enough to harvest. Um, her first bow kill in Colorado was a Boone and Crockett uh, sized bighorn sheep. Oh my goodness! Um, in the same unit, in the same unit, I killed my bighorn sheep in, and uh, it was kind of a funny story because she wasn't sure that she wanted to hunt sheep, and it's been one of those things where if you if there's an inkling that you might want to hunt sheep, you need to be put in for the license. Just period. Otherwise, you may never draw. So that's kind of what I was doing, and um, you know our kids are were younger. That was in 2009 when she killed that that sheep, and she wasn't 100% committed when she got that tag and she drew that tag. She kind of felt bad. She's like, "Well, I might be taking this opportunity away from somebody else who's been." maybe putting in longer or that wants to hunt, you know, has more of a desire to hunt these sheep. And so, um, we got over that hurdle and we, of course, I hunted that unit before and was successful and, and was able to go down there scouting a little bit. And we went and, uh, this, this particular hunt is a December hunt. So it's right kind of during or after their rut, they're kind of finishing up their rut. And we have the whole month of December to hunt these, these um, sheep and what was what was that that was I don't know if that's good or bad other than the fact that we have uh, four kids and all their Christmas school activities all their Christmas programs all that stuff's happening that month and uh, which means uh, she's not going to miss my wife is not going to miss it you know our kids uh, school activities and that sort of thing that's kind of her priority and uh, so that kind of left what was left for finding a few days here and there to go hunt. And we'd, we'd been down hunting that unit, had a couple opportunities, and uh, got within bow range and then bumped them, and, and the sheep are gone. And uh, I was able to talk her into going back. After Christmas, uh, she ended up killing her uh, sheep on the 27th after an all-day uh, stock. You know, we found them about 9 o'clock in the morning 
and she killed him right at last light. Um, so that would have been probably around, right around 4.30, um, if I remember correctly, in December. But uh, in, incredible. She didn't know what she had. Of course, uh, that was the highlight of our marriage, uh, aside from the birth of our children. <laughs> oh, and, my goodness. And so, you know, she were, we're there taking pictures. And, and uh, of course, I scanned it, and we ended up doing a life size. But at the time, she didn't, she didn't know what kind of accomplishment that was. And she threw some of the terrain that she had done. She was kind of cussing me under her breast, you know, some of the areas that we were going to stock this this sheep and um in hindsight after she's done that and seen how what an accomplishment that was and given her kind of self-confidence we've had other friends and, and women um specifically come out and, and tell her kind of what an inspiration she's been and that she's you know maybe given them new goals and things to go and, and hunt with their husbands so that's been really kind of good for her um, you know, and, and she's not one. She would never, she score doesn't matter to her. Um, that's not what it's about. And, uh, of course she doesn't ever look for any accolades or anything like that. So, um, it's just been fun to, to watch the, the other people that have come out and approached her and, and told her how important that was to them. So that's been kind of fun. And then, you know, this last season, um, I was, you know, I've had my kids out turkey hunting and uh, bow hunting for turkeys, and we haven't been successful. And uh, finally this year, my 17-year-old daughter um, thought she was ready to go ahead and hunt big game with a bow. So we, uh, she, of course, she had plenty of preference points. She, um, we drew a tag, a public land, eastern Colorado tag, and uh, went and we did scouting. We went out and hung tree stands, you know, several weeks before. And it was an opportunity for me to teach her about the hunting aspect of hunting white-tailed deer and how keen they are and trying to teach her about hunting with the wind and, you know, teach her, you know, how to find a good pinch point, a good tree stand location, um, all these different things. And um, her second day of hunting, she was fortunate enough to harvest a, a really nice, mature white-tailed buck as her first um her first bow kill. And so that, that was just, you know, I'm not sure who was more excited, uh, me or her. And I know I was more nervous when that deer was coming in than she was. She handled it like a champ. So, Oh my goodness. That was, that was, that was a lot of fun. And of course, you know, it, it was a, a, a a substantial, a substantial buck, a very, very nice first bow kill. And uh, I told her for her homework, since I pulled her out of school to go do this, uh, that she had to write an article for our um, kind of our local, our state organization, the Colorado Bow Hunter uh, Association, and as part of her homework for, for missing, I think we missed a total of four days of school. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> so, goodness. Yeah, so that's. That's her homework assignment. So we'll see if she gets it completed. <laughs> wow. Well, that's that's great. And listeners, you know, it it, it can be a family affair and, and have hunted sheep. It, that's a tough hunt. I'd, even if it, it looks simple, there's some areas that you can get on cheap. You don't have to climb 13,000 foot mountains, but it, it's a tough hunt. And I spent um, August, there were 10 tags, four people tagged out and six of us didn't. I did not. And I hunted 22 days. Yeah, yeah, that's that's tough. That's that's tough when you spend that much time and uh, you see the game and and uh, that's. But I'm sure you've got a lot of uh, memories and things. You'll never forget that hunt. I'm sure. No, because I, you know, um, the backstory is in February I get a brand new hip, and then in June I tore my rotator cuff and my bicep using free weights, but I still hunted. Oh. And, um, you know, and I climbed my first 14 or uh, one of many during that hunt, but I climbed mm-hmm. the first one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, it's just, it's just, again, I get back to the joy of the hunt and, and I can't, you know, ex- express that. You know, some of the best hunts uh, going on right now in Wisconsin and, and all the states that have a traditional gun season, Wisconsin nine day gun season, but people have generations, you know, gramps to, to you know, just kids 
at six, seven, eight years old. They're all in deer camp. They're all hearing the stories. They're going to the concussion stand or the, you know, the hideout stand or the breakout stand, blah, blah, blah. Everybody names their stands and they've been doing it for, for years. My, this year was my 50th anniversary. And I, I'm digressing a lot, but I'm so thankful. And it's appropriate. Um, Thanksgiving is just a couple of days. I'm thankful that right. I've been able to do that. One, um, have a supportive wife, have a supportive Scotland and, and Laura, my kids, and um, Kathy, my wife. They supported me in my, you know, um, my passion. And I'm, I'm uh-huh. very thankful that I, I'm sure, Sean, you could say the same thing. Absolutely, absolutely. No question about that. Yeah. So let's go. I'm I'm going to go click back here and and let's talk about what we need to do as hunters to make sure we're we're the best people or, or give uh, I guess say it this way we're the best ambassadors that we can that we can be. Right. Well, so, so that. That's a good question, and um, that's a kind of a controversial question too, um, because what's right for me might not be right for somebody else, uh, ethically speaking. But you know, one of the things that that it, it all comes down to preparedness and knowing your capabilities. And even though we always know that we're human, and as I've grown, I've I've become a more patient hunter. And I don't take shots like I used to. Um, um, I've had too many things in the past where maybe I haven't recovered an animal. And why didn't I recover that animal? And usually it can be brought back to um, something that was a little bit that, that I wouldn't normally do. And uh, so, but, but a lot of it starts with your equipment. And, um, you know, we're very... Uh, Shooting the 3D archery, that's a very controlled setting for hunting. It helps, um, but it really teaches you a lot about your equipment, how to fix your equipment, um, how to properly set up and level um, your sight. You know, there's there's a lot of um, professionals that don't really know how to level a sight properly with first, second, and third axis uh, leveling. And so I think the most important thing is just to be prepared Know your capabilities and, um, and and try not to to do something that you normally wouldn't do. Or if you tell yourself, I'm only going to take a shot out to X yardage, you know, try to stick with that. And uh, that's hard to do. I mean, there's there's been times where I've told myself, you know, out west, we, we've got longer shot opportunities, I'll say it that way. And my, you know, I shoot uh, professionally, um, you know, the three archery um, in good calm situations you know these, the equipment nowadays is extremely accurate but my rule of thumb is if I can't get within 60 yards and then even at that point if the body language or you know certain variables aren't in the shot angle all those things come into play isn't right then I won't take that shot either but there's been times where I've pushed that and uh, we're all human and at the end of the day we've got to answer to ourselves uh, in those things. Um, But being prepared, I think, is probably the most important thing. And what that means is, you know, some people, you see these guys that get their bow out of the box uh, the um, week or two before season and shoot a few arrows and, you know, it's in a controlled environment and, you know, they're keeping them in in the vitals or whatever at certain distances and they think they're good to go. And they may be to a certain degree, but, um, you know, there's, we all know hunting doesn't, um, that animal doesn't come in exactly where you think it is, or, you know, it doesn't always play out exactly how you hope. There might be a, a tree branch or a limb that you've got to contort your body to be able to shoot over, and, and uh, so you, you've got to be prepared for different scenarios that may play out. And then also be smart enough to realize, yeah, I probably shouldn't be taking this shot, or, or whatever. So let's um, touch on one thing, and then we're going to give you time to give some shout outs, and um, and we'll we'll move on, get into the grocery store, and get ready for Thanksgiving. Um, why Sounds do good. we Why do we challenge each other? Or on Facebook, I see it all the time. Social media, and sometimes at meetings, um, 
at DOW or Colorado Parks and Wildlife or, or shows where people say, oh, you're using a muzzleloader versus a, a rifle or I'm using um, a, a crossbow just because I, I can't pull back a compound anymore and other people use a stick and a string and other people use you know compounds. Why is that – Help me understand. Help me share briefly. You know what that's all about, and why we shouldn't do that. Well, that's that's pretty pretty. Uh, that's a good question. So uh, you see that even within archery, you know, guys shooting a compound versus guys shooting traditional gear. Um, I've been fortunate enough to go and help with um, uh, an organization called the PCBA, which is Physically Challenged Bow Hunters Association, or something like that. And that really opened my eyes kind of to that because we went to a, this was in uh, Gillette, Wyoming. It was an antelope hunt and there were varying degrees of disabled folks at this hunt that, you know, they, they, you have to apply and, and, you know, I think there was slots for 15 or 20 different archers and, and you had guys that would walk with a cane that were basically able-bodied all the way to guys that were using straws to steer their, their wheelchair. So you, you had the gamut of, of different degrees of what disabled would be. And you had the guys that were really disabled that basically would have a guy lining up their, their crossbow for them and they'd blow on a straw somehow and it would it would fire the shot and and you know and those guys were actually successful in harvesting antelope uh, out of lines and things and you had other guys that were using compounds and at the end of the day the joy that was on the guy that shot his with a compound versus the guy that shot his with a you know, crossbow that somebody else had basically lined up for him was the same. The experiences, the animal coming into the watering hole uh, or the fence crossing or whatever it was, the things that they saw, the hunting stories that they told in the blinds together, it, it was all the same. And then basically, they all got to see, well, I shouldn't say all because there, there was a blind person there uh, that was hunting, again, with, with an aid. Um, but all of those people got to see their arrow fly and it didn't matter how the arrow got there what kind of weapon it was the hunt that was really important in the relationships that were developed so you know i i don't know why that is such an important thing what's right for me isn't necessarily right for for you um another friend of mine who's a diehard avid bow hunter um he has a, a television show and everything well he messed up his bicep, and um, so the one year, and he's a bow hunting only guy, the one year he ended up having to hunt with a crossbow, um, and he was able to get a doctor's note, so to speak, so that he could do that during archery season and all that, but is that wrong? I don't think so. He's out in the field doing what he loves to do, pursuing game, and so, I don't know, it's, it's interesting that people downplay it or, or, or whatever, so... I don't, I don't think it's right. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're all hunters and we all need to band together and, and respect, you know, as long as it's done legally and to the best of our ethics, that's kind of all that matters really at the end of the day. Thanks so much for sharing that. And then let's take, you know, 90 seconds and give some shout outs. Make sure you get uh, your business up and, you know, and tell people how to get a hold of uh, them and then anybody else. And then we'll wrap the show, Sean. Sure. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, so, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me on, Bruce. Um, that's, it's been a pleasure getting to talk some hunting stories. Um, I also, obviously, like to do the cliche, thank my wife and family and kids and, you know, without them allowing me um, to be away doing these things, you know, where would I be? So, so uh, thanks for that. And, um, you know, my um, sponsors, I've got several sponsors, Matthews Archery, uh, Grim Reaper Broad. Has Vane Tech Veins, um, you know, Gold Tip Arrows. You know, so thanks for thanks for my sponsors, and uh, yeah, I, I, Hamsky Archery Solutions is the name of our um, company, and we basically make and manufacture um, 
archery accessories that will help you maximize your accuracy. So everything that we do is um, products that are designed to improve on um, what's not out there and to actually help you become a more accurate, uh, foolproof archer. Um, we can be um, found on Facebook, uh, Hansky Archery, um, or we can be found on the web we have a website HanskyArchery.com. And uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Well, Sean Greathouse, um, it's it's been a pure pleasure, and and thanks for uh, allowing us to do a two part show. So, folks uh, all over North America, a big, big shout out uh, to Sean Greathouse, and and you can just tell by hearing him, he he's passionate about hunting, but he's passionate about um, the journey also. So, Sean, again, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Have a good day. Hey, 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 don't forget to turn into, tune into, not to turn into the next episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. And we're going to meet with Tim Conley. Tim Conley's from Knightstown, Indiana. And folks, Indiana is putting out some big bucks. Well, we're going to talk about one special box that Tim's been chasing for a number of years and how he put him down. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.